6. The plane squealed to a stop right in front of the big monster. Dad, Nicole, and the pilot all laughed. At me. I hate that. But I couldn't blame them. The big white monster was a polar bear. A statue of a polar bear. The polar bear is a symbol of the town, the pilot explained. Oh, I murmured. I knew it was blushing. I turned away. Jordan knew that, Dad said. He was playing one of his practical jokes. Uh, yeah. I went along with it. I knew it was a statue all along. You did not, Jordan, Nicole said. You were really scared. I punched Nicole in the arm. I was not. It was a joke. Dad put an arm around each of us. Isn't it great the way these two kid each other? He said to the pilot. If you say so, the pilot replied. We hopped out of the plane. The pilot opened the cargo hold. Nicole and I grabbed our backpacks. Dad had brought a huge airtight trunk for film, cameras, food, sleeping bags, and other supplies. The pilot helped him carry it off the airstrip. The trunk was so big, Dad could fit right inside it. It reminded me of a red plastic coffin. Ignick Airport was like a tiny wooden house, just two rooms. Two pilots in leather jackets sat at a table playing cards. A tall, brawny man with dark hair, a thick beard, and leathery skin stood up and crossed the room to greet us. His gray parka hung up open over a flannel shirt and deerskin pants. This must be our guide, I realized. Mr. Blake, the man said to Dad. His voice was low and hoarse. I'm Arthur Maxwell. Need some help there? He grabbed one end of the trunk from the pilot. This is an awfully big trunk you bought, Arthur added. Do you really need all this stuff? Dad reddened. I've got a lot of cameras, tripods, and things. Well, maybe I overpacked. Arthur frowned at me and Nicole. I'd say so. Call me Gary, Dad said. These are my kids, Jordan and Nicole. He nodded toward us. Nicole said, Hi. And I added, nice to meet you. I can be polite when I have to be. Arthur stared at us. Then he grunted. You didn't mention kids, he mumbled to Dad after a minute. I'm sure I did, Dad protested. I don't remember it, Arthur replied, frowning. Everyone was silent. We pushed through the airport door and started down the muddy road. I'm hungry, I said. Let's go into town and get some food. How far is it to town, Arthur? Dad asked. How far? Arthur echoed. You're looking at it. I stared around in surprise. There was only one road. It began at the airport and ended in a pile of snow about two blocks away. A few wooden buildings were sprinkled along it. This is it? I cried. It's not Pasadena, Arthur grumbled, but we call it home. He led us down the muddy road to a diner called Betty's. I guess you're hungry, he grumbled. Might as well eat a hot meal before we set out. We settled into a booth by a window. McCall and I ordered hamburgers, french fries, and cokes. Then Arthur ordered coffee and beef stew. I've got a sled and four dogs ready to go, Arthur announced. The dogs can pull this trunk of yours and the other supplies. We'll walk beside the sled. That sounds fine, Dad said. Whoa! I protested. We're walking? How far? Ten miles or so. Arthur replied. Ten miles? I never walked that far before. Why do we have to walk? Why can't we take a helicopter or something? Because I want to take photos along the way, Jordan, Dad explained. The landscape is fascinating. You never know what we'll come across. Maybe we'll come across the abominable snowman, I thought. That would be cool. Our food arrived. We all ate in silence. Arthur wouldn't look me in the eye. He wouldn't look at any of us in the eye. He stared out the window while he ate. Outside in the street, a jeep drove by. Have you ever seen the snow creature we're looking for? Dad asked Arthur. Arthur speared a piece of meat with his fork and popped it into his mouth. He chewed. He chewed some more. Dad, Nicole, and I all watched him, waiting for his answer. Finally, he swallowed. Never seen it, he said. Heard about it, though. Lost the stories. I waited to hear one of the stories. But Arthur kept on eating. I couldn't stand waiting any longer. What kind of stories? He swallowed some gravy with his bread. He stuffed it into his mouth, chewed, swallowed. A couple of people in town, 
he said. They've seen the monster. Where? Dad asked. Out by the big snow ridge, Arthur said. Beyond the musher's cabin, when we're staying. What does he look like? I asked. They say he's big, Arthur said. Big and covered with brown fur. You might think he's a bear, but he's not. He walks on two feet like a man. I shuddered. The abominable snowman sounded a lot like a vicious cave monster I saw in a horror movie once. Arthur shook his head. Personally, I hope we never find him. Dad's jaw dropped. But that's what we're here for. It's my job to find him. If he exists. He exists, all right, Arthur declared. A friend of mine, another musher, he was out in a blizzard one day, ran smack into the snow monster. What happened? I asked. You don't want to know. Arthur stuffed more bread into his mouth. We certainly do want to know, Dad persisted. Arthur stroked his beard. The monster picked up one of the dogs and made off with him. My friend chased after him trying to get the dog back. Never found him. But he could hear the dog whining. Pitiful howls. Whatever happened to that dog? It sounded pretty bad. He's probably a carnivore, Nicole said. A meat eater. Most animals around here are. There's so little vegetation. I jabbed Nicole. I want to hear about the snowman, not your stupid nature facts. Arthur flashed Nicole an annoyed glance. I figured he was thinking, what planet is she from? That's what I'm usually thinking anyway. He cleared his throat and continued. My friend came back to town. He and another guy went out to try to capture the snow monster. Darn foolish if you ask me. What happened to them? I asked. Don't know, Arthur said. They never came back. Huh? I gaped at the big guide. I swallowed hard. Excuse me? Did you say they never came back? Arthur nodded solemnly. They never came back.